The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, we're all familiar, for the most part, with the, with the, with the Beatitudes. Uh, and there's the version that's in uh, Luke's Gospel as well, which is a little bit shorter. But uh, they both address the reality of the deficit in our world as human beings and uh, how the state of affairs is not what it could be. And... Uh, in other words, this world is a place of transition. It's a place whereby we kind of get a foretaste of the fullness of life, but we're not there. And this world is, as we see every day in our lives, when we look at billboards and the televisions and, the, and just the voice, this world is, is about trying to fill that gap, fill that incompleteness, of course, and we know that it fails. Um, but in our own lives, we need to come to terms with that. And sometimes we get down on ourselves because of that incompleteness. We should be here, we should be there, we should have this, we should have that. And that's not the reality in this world. As followers of Christ, we recognize that and we learn to deal with that as Jesus dealt with it. Jesus. As followers of Christ, we follow the way that he taught and the way that he lived. And the way that he lived, he embraced life to the fullest. He celebrated, but when it came time to let go of life, he did that freely and humbly. And he went through it. There was trepidation, but there was no hesitation. He knew his mission. He knew what this world was about, and he knew that the Father would get him through. And when we ponder that as Christians, the two great pillars of our Christian faith are the death and the resurrection of Jesus, both. And in our lives, we ponder what both mean. What is the death and the, death and the suffering and death of Jesus? What does that mean for us as a people walking this earth, as human beings, as human beings and as children of God. Well, it means that we ponder and recognize the daily sufferings in our lives. We don't go out searching for suffering. It's not that God stands back, he, he created us so that he could watch us suffer. No. He created us for life and life in the full. 
And that that's, doesn't, doesn't happen at the snap of the fingers. Uh, it, it, there's a process. We don't understand that process. And in our second in the reading, uh, St. John says, you know, what will be revealed, we don't know what, what is to be revealed yet. That's yet to come. So our disposition is to be one of recognizing our incompleteness, but having the faith to recognize of a fulfillment that's yet to come. And so the suffering that goes with that, we accept because our Lord went through it, he walks through it. There's something about it that has value in that it's moving us forward through to something greater. Because of sin in the world, because of the incompleteness, uh, because of uh, there's a lot of fear in the world. And sometimes we rebel against that process. Well, who wants to suffer, right? But the challenges of this world and the uncertainty of this world is a reality. Certainly this pandemic has brought that, just emphasized that, and it's in, really in our face, that uncertainty these days. But nevertheless, just by virtue of being in this world, there is an uncertainty that we have to learn to live with. So we're balancing faith with our, you know, our, our fears. You know, sometimes the fear gets in the way. And, well, we, 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 we don't want to suffer. We don't want to be lonely. We, we don't want those limitations. Because we were created for the fullness of life. We were created for a fullness, you know, and so we long for that. And when Jesus came into the world, he taught us about that. He says, yeah, you're not wrong thinking that, but this is what has to happen first. And then there's the resurrection. That we have to ponder as well. Both of those things, the death and the resurrection of Jesus in our Christian faith, they both hold up our, our, our faith lives as Christians. And it's in the pondering of the resurrection that we realize that we don't have to scramble and grasp for every little bit of life that we can get because we're afraid we're going to miss something. Well, that person has more than me. I've got to get that too. If this is all there was in this world, of course we'd be scrambling. And we'd be pretty depressed when we didn't get what we wanted. We thought, oh, we're missing out. But the reality is, that's not what it's ever been about. It's about the fullness of life, and it's about anticipating that fullness. And it's about knowing authentically where we are now, and knowing that God loves us and accept us, accepts us where we are now, and that we're not even equipped, we're not nearly equipped enough to, to go it alone. And that's where Christ comes in. That's where the, the, the guidance of the Spirit keeps us moving forward and helps us understand that we are a work in progress. The first four Beatitudes, they address the state that, states that are not necessarily desirable states to be in. You know, being poor in spirit, being mourning, you know, being in mourning being meek and hungry and in a state of deficit. These aren't prized states in the world's eyes. But remember, God chose those whom the world considers absurd to shame the wise so that humanity, humanity do, can do no boasting before God. By Jesus' acknowledging these states as blessed, he says, He's saying, look, despite what the world thinks, this is a common condition and very human state and an honorable state. In fact, these qualities are very compatible with a person who has a loving heart. And in this world, to be in these states is very much a part of what it means to be on a path to God. After all, the things God considers truly honorable are often at odds with what human beings of any culture think. And we, as members of a culture ourselves, there's a part of us that has been conditioned to reject these states because they're manifestations of our brokenness, our incompleteness, and not wholeness. 
And we desire wholeness because ultimately, as I said, this is what we were created for, to be whole. But brokenness is the state of this world. So the first four Beatitudes acknowledge our incompleteness as human beings, but that this incompleteness will not be forever because of God who has not abandoned his original plan of fulfillment. And sometimes we get caught up in that, oh, he's abandoned us, he's forgetting us, oh, he, is there a God? You know, we get trapped in that sometimes. And we look at the story of Emmaus, how they were going back along the road dejected, and the stranger, Jesus, came along and says, well, this was, hang in there, this is meant to happen. This is all part of it. Hang in there. And the next three Beatitudes, the blessedness of the merciful, the pure of heart, and the peacemakers. These describe qualities of God. Being merciful, that's the opposite of being judgmental. Being peacemakers, as a peacemaker, the gospel says that we'll be called children of God. And being pure of heart is the quality that allows us to see God. Getting away from the clutter of this world, purifying our hearts. That's what our lives are about, growing in holiness, purifying our hearts, spending time examining our consciences. Where have I gone wrong? Where has anger gotten in the way? Where has my pride or my ego kept me from responding in a way that's grateful or a way that is forgiving to the person beside me? Or, or has caused me to be impatient when I need to be patient and persevere and live in the moment? We're called to grow in holiness and it's a work in progress because we don't always feel that holy especially when we're upset, especially when we're feeling a little bit lonely and afraid and things aren't going the way we think they should go. But nevertheless, we're a work in progress. Now this weekend we celebrate All Saints today and tomorrow we celebrate All Souls Day where we commemorate and ponder the reality of those who've gone before us and have left a legacy of holiness, enough to inspire us to inspire us onward to holiness. And we have relatives who have gone before us and who are now experiencing the presence of God in a deeper way than we can in this world. The communion of saints inspires us. Inspires us to ponder that connection that we have with those who have gone before us. Those we've known in our lives the saints in heaven, we are connected with them as we struggle along in a darkened world and we, we sometimes forget that. Well, we often forget that because we have to deal with this world every day. The communion of saints is a beautiful concept for us because as we recognize the Paschal mystery, the death and resurrection of our Lord, he's that great link that connects us with our families who have gone before us and our Heavenly Father and all the saints. It reminds us that we can communicate through prayer, that we can pray prayers of intercession. You know, at the communion of saints, we're all praying together for one another. And that beautiful image in the first reading from Revelation of the countless numbers of people in robes praising God how often do we ponder that reality and pray that we become a part of that? That is the fulfillment of our humanity. It's a beautiful image to carry with us. So though we may not be in the state of holiness of many of the saints who've gone before us, certainly we, and certainly we may not even have to face the same persecutions in this life that those radical followers of Jesus and Jesus himself had to face. But if we give God something to work with, that's a start. To be on this path toward holiness gives us and others hope and eventually builds on itself. 
That requires perseverance and patience, as I said. Patience with ourselves and with those around us, and it requires faith. St. Paul says, or, or St. John says in the second reading, as I said before, we are God's children now, and what we shall be has not yet been revealed. So as we prepare to celebrate Eucharist together, we are mindful of our yes and that movement toward holiness, and that we are called to ever take in more the life of Christ, through the Eucharist, through his word proclaimed, through our prayer, that we follow his way ever more closely, grow in holiness, and narrow that gap or that darkened space between us and the communion of saints as we move forward and anticipate the fullness of life. Amen.